Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. I think um, all of you will have had um, invigorating debates in the um, four special sessions that uh, started at 9.30 this morning on uh, Syria, on sectarianism and extremism, on the shifting regional balance, and on changing energy markets and Middle East uh, security. I uh, took the privilege of the organizer of popping in and out of all four uh, meetings, and I saw that in uh, each of the four there was uh, both animated and very reasoned um, debate going on. I'm uh, delighted that we've provided uh, also some private settings for uh, discussing in more detail uh, some of the issues uh, that were addressed by uh, the plenary speakers uh, on uh, Saturday and that are in the minds of the many uh, officials, parliamentarians, strategists, and analysts that we've been lucky enough uh, to convene at this uh, 2013 uh, Manama Dialogue. Uh, this is our uh, final uh, plenary session, the fifth plenary session, and uh, it's been uh, uh, organized, as you see, uh, in order to uh, provide an opportunity to talk about uh, international interest in Middle East uh, security uh, and uh, non-proliferation, an issue that has been uh, at the front of our minds uh, during these last uh, uh, 36 hours. Uh, and I will offer uh, a minute or two of concluding remarks uh, at the very uh, end to uh, sum up what I think uh, all of you will have by then agreed uh, to have been a very successful uh, Manama Dialogue uh, 2013. And as I'll say, in 90 minutes or so, uh, by Monday morning, we'll be beginning already the planning for the Manama Dialogue 2014 and also uh, for following up uh, many of the issues that will have been uh, raised here uh, by ministers and analysts to uh, look at in uh, closer detail. Uh, the Institute is not just a convener of events, uh, but um, uh, an executor of strategic thought uh, and um, we hope uh, in the next uh, six months uh, to be publishing uh, more intensely on uh, many of these uh, uh, issues. Um, I'm delighted, uh, by the way, to report, since I've got 30 seconds more to talk about the IISS, that the uh, Adelphi book uh, that uh, we launched uh, some months ago on Iraq by Dr. Toby Dodge was uh, voted by The Economist, one of the best uh, books of the year. And uh, the study that we um, completed uh, three months ago uh, by Emil Hokayem on uh, Syria is one of the best-selling ever Adelphi books and is already being used as a, a textbook in a number of universities. So we're proud uh, that uh, the analytical work we do that is informed by the happy access we have to so many important government leaders and opinion formers in this region has been received uh, in this uh, way. Uh, the Manama Dialogue is constructed to ensure uh, that all uh, regions of the world that have a, a stake and interest uh, in uh, Gulf security are uh, fully represented. Uh, and uh, uh, we have always been keen since the inception of the Manama Dialogue uh, to uh, ensure what for today's purposes I should style the Indo-Pacific is properly represented uh, at the uh, Manama Dialogue. And I promise you that in 2014, uh, we are keen to have uh, more representation from ASEAN and the uh, Indo-Pacific region uh, generally. But uh, we're really honored that at this uh, Manama Dialogue, we have uh, the Minister for External Affairs of India, Salman uh, Khurshid, to provide uh, a really important uh, perspective on uh, the title of, of uh, this theme. And in a moment, I will ask him to take the podium and uh, address this fifth plenary uh, session. Uh, as I've reported in the past, uh, in 2003, when I began thinking about the idea of having a Manama Dialogue, one of the first people I uh, consulted uh, to um, learn whether this might be a project that might be warmly accepted in the region was His Royal Highness Prince Torki Al-Faisal bin Abdulaziz Al-Saud, then uh, the 
ambassador of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, in the United Kingdom, and we've relied since uh, uh, the Manama Dialogue's in inception on his wise advice on, on how to um, uh, carry out the Manama Dialogue process. I'm, I'm delighted that again he's joining us on, on the podium. Uh, I remember when I was in uh, Tehran in uh, uh, the mid-2000s, I had a number of meetings with uh, Syed Hussein Musevian, who was then uh, working uh, with the Supreme National Security Council that was then headed by a gentleman called Mr. Rouhani, who is now, of course, uh, the president um, uh, of uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And Syed Hussein Musevian has been involved in many of the early rounds on the uh, nuclear negotiations on the Iranian uh, side of the table, but also uh, on a number of other sensitive files that uh, Iran has uh, had with uh, uh, members of um, uh, the Gulf Cooperation uh, Council states, and he brings uh, to this session both his experience as a uh, policymaker and as a close advisor to now uh, President Rouhani and also Foreign Minister uh, Zarif, as well as the analytical approach that will have been uh, further marinated in his period now uh, as Associate Research Scholar at Princeton uh, University. Uh, and it's a particular pleasure also to have on the podium uh, Dr. Gary Seymour, uh, who for a number of years was Senior Fellow for Non-Proliferation and then Director of Studies at the International Institute uh, for Strategic Studies, uh, and has uh, not just a uh, strategic knowledge of uh, uh, the region, but a, a real technical appreciation of some of the uh, non-proliferation uh, issues that um, uh, that exist in the region, um, uh, knows the detail of the subject very well, uh, so much so that uh, he for a number of years became uh, President Obama's uh, uh, coordinator for uh, non-proliferation issues. I think uh, President Obama referred to uh, Gary Seymour as my nuclear guy from time to time, and he left that position only a few months ago to uh, return to uh, Harvard University, so I promise you his uh, perspective is entirely up to date. So that's the panel you have in front of you. They will speak in the order uh, that I've called them, and then we'll have, uh, uh, I'm sure, a very vigorous dialogue and conversation. Foreign Secretary, please, the podium is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, uh, delighted to be here uh, as the first time uh, participation of India's foreign minister in uh, this very important Manama dialogue. Delighted to be here in the presence of Dr. Chipman, uh, all the distinguished participants, your highnesses, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me first thank the International Institute of Strategic Studies for inviting me for this prestigious event. As I said, first time that Indian foreign minister is participating, and I uh, deeply uh, and gratefully thank the Kingdom of Bahrain for this excellent sponsorship and this opportunity. We treat the uh, uh, Gulf region as the extended neighborhood of our country uh, with important historical linkages an artery for the flow of goods and ideas uh, and movements of people from and to India. Uh, just one subject, seaborne trade, is enough to illustrate the learning that has happened in the two directions between our uh, two regions. In addition to these historical civilizational links, there are several factors of contemporary importance in our relationship with the countries of the Gulf. Let me list the vital stakes that India has with the Gulf countries. As a region, Gulf is our largest trading partner. Our bilateral trade with Gulf has increased from 167 billion US dollars as recently as 2012 to over 180 billion dollars in 2012 and 13. The traditional dominance of oil exports, of course, persists, but there are encouraging trends. For instance, our exports to Saudi Arabia alone increased by over 70 percent last year to reach uh, nearly 10 billion US dollars. Two-thirds of India's oil and gas requirements come from the Gulf region and thus the region plays a very important role in our energy security perceptions. We have uh, something around 7 million Indians uh, who live and work in the Gulf and their remittances 
contribute something like 40% of our total inward uh, remittances every year. Uh, and therefore, this is an important factor in our external finances. The contribution of India's expatriates to the socio-economic development of their host countries is well recognized and they are respected for their technical competence, sense of discipline, non-involvement in regional political issues and for their law-abiding nature. And I take this opportunity to particularly express my gratitude to the countries of the region for playing host to such a large population of Indians. The Gulf region is also a potential source of investments in our, uh, our country. The GCC members have significant surplus capital, as we know, and India remains one of the few countries that have the capacity to absorb large capital inflows for infrastructure development. The Gulf is now a significant platform for operations of Indian companies as well. It is also a hub for out, outbound Indian passenger tourists uh, with 700 flights a week between UAE and India alone. Relevant to this, uh, the theme of this meeting, there are new areas of growing importance. Uh, we are adding, uh, for, for instance, in the area of, of uh, counterterrorism, money laundering, anti-piracy, uh, very, very important, significant, critical areas of cooperation. We are adding joint military exercises, friendly visits of naval ships, broad-based MOUs on defense cooperation to the traditional templates of bilateral cooperation that we already have. We remain engaged on issues of uh, WMD proliferation and disarmament in the Middle East, given the global impact of WMD proliferation, including on India's own security interests, and given India's consistent commitment to the global and verifiable elimination of all weapons of mass discretion. And I will, I will I will return to this briefly. We have, of course, like everybody else in the world, uh, watched carefully the so-called Arab, Arab Spring. Um, India is, as you all know, ladies and gentlemen, a vibrant democracy, and we find that such a political system as ours best suits the national temperament and needs of our country. We are in favor of democratic pluralism and religious moderation, but it is very clear to us that it is up to the people of a country and a region to decide the pace and the means to achieve those goals where such goals are preferred, keeping in mind the traditions and history of the people. We are also against armed conflict or external intervention as a way of resolving political issues in any region here or elsewhere in the world. We've seen the two and a half years of the Arab Spring and a lot of the initial optimism has given way to serious concerns and reflection about the aftermath of the much hyped events. Um, of course, uh, there is, uh, I understand, a concern the, of the hijacking of genuine demands for democracy change and pluralism by radical elements who may well be driven by narrow agendas. We see this, for example, in Syria. The second is the exacerbation of sectarian divides. The horrific sectarian killings in Iraq and Libya are a daily reminder of this danger to all of us. All those who live in plural societies, as we do, uh, can be affected by tendencies of a growing divide. Jockeying to shift the strategic balance to advantage of those unaffected by Arab Spring has further added to the climate of political uncertainty generated by the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Such a climate of political upheaval makes developing stable bilateral cooperation difficult. Egypt, a vital partner in the Arab world, is a case in point, and yet we have persevered and have succeeded in ensuring that our relationship with Egypt remains intact, indeed, uh, the recent visit of the foreign minister to our country and my uh, interaction with him is indicative of how convergent we can be in proceeding forward even as we tackle our own respective priorities at home. The most serious situation today, of course, as we have noted, is Syria. The humanitarian impact of the war has been heart-rending, nearly one-fourth of the country's population being displaced beyond their homes and, the, and their own territories. 
India condemns violence of all si by all sides and supports the dialogue and negotiations between the government and the insurgents, leading to the formation of a transitional governing body followed by elections, as envisaged under the Geneva communique of June 2012. Any external military intervention is unlikely to help. Apart from the question of legality, there are concerns about spillover effects of any such action and the possibly undesirable consequences that fuel extremism. The only silver lining, of course, is in the recent weeks is the rapid progress that's been made on the issue of chemical weapons. I'm happy to share with this distinguished audience that India's decision to provide one million US dollars is our commitment to see the end of uh, this, uh, this uh, within a time-bound program of destruction of all chemical weapons. This is in keeping with India's active participation in the Chemical Weapons Convention and our firm commitment to the global and verifiable elimination of all weapons of mass destruction. The peaceful resolution of the crisis over serious chemical weapons shows that global non-discriminatory regimes on non-proliferation and disarmament matter, and that they have a crucial role in resolving international security challenges. And I'm sure that this is a view that is shared by a large number of our colleagues here. The Iranian nuclear issue has, again, been festering for several years, creating uncertainty across and beyond the region. And even the first steps that have been taken continue to leave a lot of questions, as I noticed yesterday. We welcome the agreement in Geneva reached on 24th of November between Iran and E3 plus 3. This agreement is consistent with India's position that the issue should be resolved diplomatically and on the basis of recognition of Iran's right to peaceful uses of nuclear energy and in accordance with Iran's international obligations as a non-nuclear weapon state. We also welcome the agreement reached on 11 November between Iran and IAEA, which is the competent technical agency to verify the exclusively peaceful nature of Iran's nuclear activities on practical measures for enhanced IAEA verification activity at Iranian nuclear sites. This should help rebuild confidence in the peaceful nature of Iran's nuclear activities. It is our hope that the interim steps that have been agreed in Geneva would build trust and confidence between Iran and the international community and lead to a durable and long-term settlement, not only of the Iranian nuclear issue, but of all other issues that were uh, of major concern in the months and years that have passed. I'm pleased to share with this audience that we have not let the recent uncertainties come in the way of our growing engagement with all countries in the Arabian Peninsula and the broader Middle East. This mutually beneficial engagement is based on a clear-headed assessment of our national interests and our bilateral complementarities. Our successful efforts to upgrade our relations with both Saudi Arabia and Iraq are an illustration of this approach, and I have recently visited both countries, and I must put on record my appreciation for uh, the convergence of opinions that we were able to arrive at. The cooperation we are getting on counterterrorism, for example, is a tribute to the mutual trust and understanding that we have been able to build together. Further in the Middle East, another example is a bilateral engagement we have, as I mentioned, been able to construct with Egypt. My dear friend Nabil Fami uh, was in India just a few days ago, and despite the rapidly changing political landscape in the re region, we continue to work apace. Before concluding, let me dwell for a while on some of the long-term strategic facets of India's relationship with the Gulf. Uh, let us take the energy security first. India is uh, not only uh, heavily dependent on the Gulf region for its energy supply, but is also a dependable and long-term market for Gulf countries. Serious efforts are being made to transform this relationship from a buyer-seller one to a more broad-based one with equity participation partnership in oil production, joint ventures in oil exploration, petrochemical complexes, fertilizer plants, and partnership in strategic reserve storage facility being built, built up in India. We do know that due to the discovery of shale gas in the U.S. and its cost-effective extraction, U.S. dependence on the Middle East, oil and energy would decline. And so uh, the, the current oil consumer markets of India, China, Japan, and ROK will 
will proportionately gain greater, greater importance. If technology evolves and geopolitics permits, as I'm sure it will soon, a number of different pipelines, either overland or undersea, can begin to carry gas from the Gulf to India, the nearest large size market for Gulf exports from the Gulf. This could herald the next phase of energy security cooperation between our two sides and could pull together Central, West, and South, Southern Asia into a hub of energy driven economic cooperation. Next, there is the investment and economic cooperation. Despite being India's largest trading partners, the investments by India and in Gulf in each other's territories have remained far below their potential. With F while FDI investment from Gulf countries into India stands modestly at US $3 billion from April 2000 to August 2013, the portfolio investment figure somewhat higher. Sovereign wealth funds of the Gulf countries can be a game changer for infrastructure investment in India, which would add a stable and profitable element to the portfolio of assets held by them. In the other direction, the Oman India Fertilizer Company, with an investment of US dollars 969 million, is India's largest joint venture abroad and a successful example of the possibilities of economic integration between India and Gulf. Bilateral cooperation in the field of higher education, skill development, agriculture, tourism, healthcare, power, and infrastructure products can add heft to the existing trade ties for too long centered on oil alone. And the third and the final uh, facet is the long-term cooperation in defense security. Our security cooperation with the GCC countries is developing to mutual benefit. An example is the 2011 Agreement on Security Cooperation with UAE, which provides for cooperation to combat terrorism, organized crime, drug trafficking, weapons smuggling, money laundering, economic crimes, and cyber crimes. The region sits astride the strategic sea lines of communication, SLOCs, and any disruption of these can have a serious impact on the Indian economy, including in terms of energy supplies. It is important to keep the region out of bounds for pirates and other nefarious non-state actors. India has the cap capabilities and the will to not only safeguard India's own coastline and island territories, but also contribute to keeping our region's SLOCs open and flowing. The Indian Navy has continuously deployed one ship since October 2008 in the Gulf of Aden for anti-piracy duties with operational turnarounds at Salala in Oman. Let me conclude my presentation, ladies and gentlemen, by underlining the high priority we attach to our economic, political, and security relations with the Middle East, in particular the countries of the Gulf region. These relations are poised to grow with increasing realization of the existing enormous potential on both sides, even through the broader context in which we seek to pursue this cooperation might seem fraught and unpredictable, but our commitment is steady. The region will find in India a steady and stable long-term partner, sensitive to its needs and alive to the opportunities to develop bilateral cooperation. You can see how important our uh, interests are how important our historical context is, and therefore how important our steady commitment to the Gulf region is. Thank you very much. Minister, thank you very much for um, underlining uh, the thickening up of relations between India and the Gulf states, uh, including uh, in the realm of uh, defense and security uh, cooperation. Um, let me advise people uh, as we go down uh, the group here that if you're interested in asking a question, put your badge in the microphone and press the microphone button. Your microphone won't be on, uh, but I'll know that you uh, wish the floor and I'll uh, make certain that uh, uh, you'll be able to ask a, 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 a question and, and make a comment. Your Royal Highness, Prince Torquay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أولا أشكر السيد مضيفنا اليوم لما تفضل به من ناحية التشاور في إيجاد هذه المنتدى الذي يؤتي ثمارها سنة بعد سنة وحكومة البحرين على هذه الدعوة الكريمة للحضور في هذا الملتقى المفيد بالنسبة لموضوع عدم انتشار 
الاسلحه النوويه فكان لي الفرصه ان اساهم في عامي 2009 و2010 في مجلس منع انتشار وازاله الاسلحه النوويه الذي اسسته حكومتي اليابان واستراليا وصدر عن هذا المجلس مقترحات قدمت لمؤتمر مراجعة اتفاقية عدم انتشار الأسلحة النووية في نيويورك في عام 2010 والذي وصل بدوره إلى اقتراح أن يكون هناك مؤتمرا يعقد في عام 2012 في مدينة هلسنكي في فنلندا للنظر في إنشاء منطقة محظورة الأسلحة ذات الدمار الشامل في الشرق الأوسط ووافق على هذا الاقتراح كافة أعضاء الاتفاقية التي عقدت في أعوام الستينات من القرن الماضي ولموضوع عدم انتشار الأسلحة النووية في منطقة الشرق الأوسط وبالذات إنشاء الزون حق حق المنطقة المحظورة من الأسلحة النووية وذات الدمار الشامل هناك تاريخ يختلفها ففي عام 1394 الهجرية 1974 الميلادية تقدم شاه إيران إلى الأمم المتحدة باقتراح أن ينشأ في منطقة الشرق الأوسط منطقة محظورة من السلاح النووي وتطور هذا الاقتراح في عام 1995 من قبل الرئيس حسني مبارك باقتراح أن يصبح تصبح هذه المنطقة أيضا محظورة أسلحة الدمار الشامل بالكامل بما فيها الكيماوية والبيولوجية وتدرج هذا الاقتراح في الأمم المتحدة إلى أن وصل إلى عام 2010 عندما قرر أن يكون هناك مؤتمرا لنزع لوضع المنطقة محظورة الأسلحة النووية وغيرها في منطقة الشرق الأوسط وللأسف أنه في عام 2012 وتقريبا أسبوعين قبل أن يعقد المؤتمر في هلسنكي الذي قرر في عام 2010 أعلنت الولايات المتحدة أنه لم يتم الاتفاق بعد على كيفية عقد هذا المؤتمر وأنه الأفضل أن يؤجل فأجل ونحن الآن في العام الذي تلا وفي الشهر الذي كان المفروض أن يعقد فيه هذا المؤتمر في هلسنكي وأرجو أن تستمر دولة فنلندا في متابعة هذا الموضوع كما أرجو من الدول الراعية لهذا المقترح التي هي بريطانيا والولايات المتحدة والاتحاد الروسي والأمم المتحدة أن تستمر في مجهودها لعقد هذا المؤتمر ليس فقط لأهميته بالنسبة لنا في الشرق الأوسط ولكن أيضا لأهمية ما سيوجده من سوابق لمناطق أخرى ذات حساسية كبيرة وحصل فيها انتشار الأسلحة ذات الدمار الشامل وخاصة النووية منها فالمقترح الذي تقدمت به قبل عدة شهور لإحدى جامعات الولايات المتحدة هو أن تكون هذه المنطقة المحظورة الأسلحة ذات الدمار الشامل تحظى بضمانين من الدول الخمس دائمة العضوية في مجلس الأمن وهي الولايات المتحدة والاتحاد الروسي وبريطانيا وفرنسا والصين وهذين الضمانين هما أولا أن توفر هذه الدول الخمس مجتمعة ضمانا بحماية هذه المنطقة محظورة الأسلحة ذات الدمار الشامل في الشرق الأوسط من أي تهديد أو خطر نووي أو غيره قد يهددها من أي طرف آخر الضمان الآخر 
هو أن تسعى هذه الدول الخمس ذات العضوية الدائمة في الأمم المتحدة أيضا لمعاقبة أي من دول هذه المنطقة في الشرق الأوسط الذي يرى أنها تسعى للحيازة على أو تطوير سلاح ذو دمار شامل ليس فقط اقتصاديا وسياسيا وإن وإنما أيضا أن يكون هناك عقابا عسكريا تضمنه الدول الخمس دائمة العضوية في الأمم المتحدة وبدون هذين الضمانين فلا أعتقد أن هذا الموضوع سينجح لعدة أسباب أولا لدينا في منطقة الشرق الأوسط كما تعلمون دولة لديها أسلحة ذات دمار شامل وليس فقط نووية وهي إسرائيل حتى لو لم تعترف بذلك إسرائيل فالكل يعلم أن لديها مئات الرؤوس النووية كما أن لديها برنامجين للسلاح الكيماوي وللسلاح البيولوجي ولم يذكرها أحد للأسف حتى الآن وهناك دولة كانت هناك شكوك حول برنامجها النووي وهي إيران ولذلك المجهود الذي بذل خلال العشر سنوات الماضية لإقناع إيران بأن لا يكون لديها مثل هذا التوجه وصل بنتيجة إلى قبل عدة أسابيع أن يكون هناك اتفاقا مرحليا لإيقاف برنامج إيران في التخصيب وإدخال تفتيش مركز على كافة المنشآت الإيرانية المتعلقة بهذا الأمر لضمان شفافية نشاطاتها وبحوثها ومعرفة ما إذا كانت فعلا صادقة فيما تقول بأن برنامجها النووي هو برنامج سلمي ولا لا فأتخيل معكم أيها الحضور الكرام لو أن هذه العشر سنوات التي قضيت في متابعة إيران ثم معاقبتها من خلال ال الذي صدر القرارات التي صدرت من مجلس الأمن لو أن هذا المجهود بذل في إقامة المنطقة محظورة الأسلحة ذات الدمار الشامل في الشرق الأوسط من وجهة نظري لكانت هذه العشر سنوات أفود بكثير مما وصلنا إليه الآن فالمجهود الدبلوماسي والبشري والاقتصادي والعقوبات وغيرها ربما كانت أدت إلى إقامة هذه المنطقة بدلاً من أن يكون التركيز فقط على إيران ومشروعها النووي ولكن اليوم تحصيل حاصل هذا إنجاز مهم الذي أنجز في الأسابيع الماضية ولكن لا يستحق حتى الآن التصفيق لأننا لم نرى بعد أين سينتهي هذا المجهود الذي أنجز قبل أسابيع وإنما التمنيات كلها للخمسة زائد واحد مع إيران بأن يسهموا في انتقالنا جميعا إلى بر الأمان في اتفاقية تضمن دائمية عدم انتشار أسلحة ذات الدمار الشامل في منطقتنا بالكامل ولكي يكون هذا أمرا ذو جدية فاقترحت في الماضي وأكرر اقتراحي أن من يتولى المفاوضات في هذا الشأن لا يقتصر فقط على الدول ذات العضوية الدائمة في الأمم المتحدة وألمانيا وإيران وإنما يضاف إليها أيضا دول مجلس التعاون لكي يكون هناك جمع كامل للدول المعنية بهذا الشأن فإيران تقع على الخليج وأي مجهود قد يحدث إن كان عسكري أو غيره بالنسبة لإيران فهو سيؤثر علينا كلنا في منطقة الخليج ناهيك عن الاعتبارات البيئية التي تواجهنا جميعاً من أي نشاط في إنشاء 
منظومة من المفاعلات الذرية كما تسعى إليه إيران وكما نسعى إليه نحن في المملكة العربية السعودية وبادرت به دولة الإمارات العربية فكل هذه الأمور يجب أن يشملها هذا الحوار الذي هو قائم الآن وبصفة منقوصة ولذلك وجود دول مجلس التعاون على طاولة البحث في هذا الأمر سيكون لها مردود جيد علينا كلنا بالنسبة للأمن في المنطقة فهذا الشق الذي يتعلق بالأسلحة ذات الدمار الشامل ولكن هناك كما تعلمون وكما نشاهد يوميا على شاشات التلفزيون أمور عدة تقلقنا في منطقة الخليج من سلامة أمننا فيها بدءا من القضية الفلسطينية التي وبالرغم من المجهود المحمود الذي يقوم به وزير خارجية الولايات المتحدة في هذا الشأن فلا يزال لدينا كثير من التساؤل والتحفز لمعرفة ما سينتهي إليه هذا المجهود فالسيد كري وضع برنامج من تسعة شهور هذا الشهر يمضي منه ثلاثة ويبقى أمامنا ستة أشهر ويبدو عندنا في هذه المنطقة موضوع الستة شهور هذه أصبحت ركيزة لأي عمل يقوم فينا فكما شاهدنا أمس وزير الدفاع الأمريكي يقترح أن يكون هناك اجتماع بين وزراء الدفاع في دول المجلس والولايات المتحدة خلال ستة شهور كما أن موضوع إزالة الأسلحة الكيماوية من سوريا سينتهي بعد ستة شهور ولا أعلم هل هذه الستة شهور هي مقصودة كوسيلة لإظهار لنا في المنطقة أن هناك جدية لدى العاملين في هذا المجال لإنجاز ما وعدوا به أم أنها مجرد صدفة تراكمت على كل هذه المواضيع فلسطين السلاح الكيماوي في سوريا السلاح النووي في إيران وغيرها من الأمور ولكننا سنبقى وسنترقب هذه الستة شهور ونتمنى إن شاء الله التوفيق فيها كلها وإذا كان هناك عامل أعتقد لا بد من ذكره وخاصة في دولة البحرين وهو أن التدخل الخارجي في المنطقة هو أيضا يقلق ويؤرق أمننا ويجعلنا متوجسين من المستقبل لأننا حتى اليوم وبالرغم مما أشاحت به الدولة الشقيقة إيران من ابتسامة عريضة تجاهنا خلال الشهرين الماضيين لازلنا نجد لها تدخلات مباشرة في شؤوننا العربية امتدادا من البحرين وإلى فلسطين فالإخوة في إيران لا بد عليهم أن يعوا أن أي إشاحة لابتسامة عريضة يوجهوها لنا لن تؤخذ بالجدية إلا إذا وجدنا ما يواكبها من خطوات فعلية لسحب تدخلاتهم من البلدان العربية وكلنا مستعدين للتعاون مع إيران لأنها جارة ولها تاريخ عريق وعلاقات متميزة معنا طوال آلاف السنين وستبقى جارة فالجغرافيا لا يمكن أن تتغير كما أنها دولة مسلمة ونحن في المملكة العربية السعودية نستضيف سنويا مئات الألوف من الشعب الإيراني يأتوا لأداء مناسكهم في الحج والعمرة بكل ترحيب وبكل امتنان وبكل توافق ولكن نريد أن نطور هذه العلاقة ولا تبقى محصورة في الحجيج الذين يأتون والسبيل الوحيد لتحسين العلاقات بيننا وبين الشقيقة إيران هو بأن تكون عامل للاستقرار وليس عاملا للارتياب والشك فأتمنى على المسؤولين في إيران أن يراعوا هذا الأمر وأملنا كبير في الرئيس روحاني الذي بدوره عندما كان مسؤولا 
في الحقبات السابقة من تاريخ إيران الحديث وقع على اتفاقية أمنية مع المملكة العربية السعودية وكان من الداعين دائما لتطوير العلاقات بين البلدين فأرجو من, من الإخوان في إيران أن يأخذوا هذا بعين الاعتبار وأن يكون بيننا وبينهم المودة والصداقة وحسن الجوار وشكرا لكم Your Royal Highness, thank you uh, uh, very much uh, for uh, uh, those uh, words and, 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 and especially your uh, concluding thoughts on how uh, uh, relations between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, might uh, evolve. I, I note also, given the emphasis you placed on the role of the UN Security Council in assuring uh, that the non-proliferation treaty was actually adhered to, uh, that you um, added to uh, the UN's existing uh, responsibility to protect doctrine, in essence a responsibility to punish doctrine, uh, uh, at least a responsibility to punish those uh, who were demonstrably um, in consistent defiance of uh, uh, the NPT treaty. So it's another uh, burden uh, on the um, uh, shoulders of the UN Security Council, but it is uh, an idea uh, that I think is also worth deliberating just uh, 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 like your very important initiative that you described on, on, on an enhanced GCC role uh, in the Iranian nuclear negotiations. Um, could I now invite Mr. Musavian to uh, address us? Assalamu alaikum. First of all, uh, I would like to express my deep gratitude to John and his colleagues at IISS and the government of Bahrain for invitation and organizing such a big event, facilitating the peace in the Middle East and in the Persian Gulf. World powers have for decades raced to dominate the Middle East and the Persian Gulf, and due to its strategic location, with its importance for global energy security, such rivalry will continue to attract the interest of the world powers. However, the nature of this relationship for the past decades has, has been challenging to the region and requires a rethinking. The Middle East has been and continues to be in turmoil with global powers competing to dominate the region, while the regional rivalries continue to reshape the geopolitical landscape. Iraq's invasion of Iran and subsequent invasion of Kuwait, the US wars in, Iran, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the Syrian crisis, terrorism and extremism, have made the Middle East one of the most vulnerable region on the planet. This situation is further exacerbated by the lack of a meaningful regional cooperation system to address security issues. A major source of tension in the region is due to more relationships between the US and Iran. Iran has been accused of attempting to export its revolution to the region based on this assumption and, do, and to contain Iran, the US and its allies have fought wars with Iran for over three decades. The cost in blood and treasure are horrendous with the end result placing the US and its allies in a worse off position than when they started. Iran has been under three decades of political economic intelligence war, yet today, more than ever, proponents of such policies are concerned with the growing power and influence of Iran. While the US Arab allies are at their most vulnerable ever. Moreover, the followers of fanatic religious school of thought who perpetrated the terrorist attacks of 9-11 
followed by the other terrorist attacks in London, Madrid, and elsewhere, are now emerging from Syria and risk spreading toward the region. However, after three decades of confrontation, neither the West nor Iran or the Arab countries succeeded in achieving their respective maximalist goals. Saddam and its allies failed to disintegrate Iran after eight years imposed war. The U.S. has failed to bring about regime change in Iran. Saudi Arabia has failed to roll back the Shia revival in the region. Saudi Arabia has failed to establish its hegemony over the other Sunni Arab countries. The GCC has failed to be a meaningful and inclusive regional cooperation system. Turkey's dream of a new version of Ottoman Empire have also proved highly unrealistic. Arab-Israeli peace remains as elusive as ever. Iran has failed to liberate Palestine. Egypt has failed to maintain democracy after the collapse of Mubarak. The U.S. has failed to establish Pax Americana in the Middle East. The West has failed to protect some of, his, uh, some of its despotic allies in the region. With all respect to what Secretary Hegel offered to GCC in the opening session yesterday, the U.S. cannot remain current level of its presence in the region for an indefinite period. The failed strategies of the last three decades suggest that, first, no single country can dominate the entire region. Second, the current regional, uh, regional court war between Iran and the GCC should not continue. Third, zero-sum game does not work. And fourth, the need for reordering the, regional, the region according to a new paradigm, whereby maximalist goals are avoided, and instead the principal security concerns of each state is recognized. This reordering process is not possible unless the U.S., the world powers, and the region respect the legitimate role and interest of Iran in the Persian Gulf, the Middle East, and Southwest Asia. Among all the conflicts in the region, one pitting the United States against Iran is the most fundamental, and its resolution could unlock doors for security and stability stretching from North Africa to Central Asia. The state of fatigue that both the U.S. and the region feel following decades of pursuing maximalist goals is a primary reason to proceed with a new approach toward Iran. The interim agreement on Iran's nuclear program is a good start and a win-win for all. By making the deal with Iran, the U.S. has taken the first step in the right direction. Some regional countries who are deterred by doubts and resistance should instead support, instead support Iran-U.S. detente because it is in the interest of all regional countries and that of global peace. Iran's goal in the nuclear negotiation is not just an easing of sanctions. The main objective is detente with the region and the West. Tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia is an important source of problem in the region. Iran and Saudi Arabia both need to recognize its natural influence role and interest in the region, and with it, extend the level of respect each deserves. The U.S. should support a Saudi-Iran tension-free relations. To establish regional cooperation system in the Persian Gulf, the role of the U.S. would be vital. None of the other world powers have the resources or influence, and more important, the willingness to play such a role. The detente between Iran and the U.S. in combination with improved relations between Iran and the GCC 
could lead to a change of paradigm in international and regional relations. This is the only way toward the establishment of a new political security cooperation structure in the region. Such paradigm change would have positive outcome not only for Iran and the US, but for all entire region of the Middle East. That's why the nuclear deal carries with it the possibility of transforming the entire Middle East in a positive and constructive way. Thanks to a GCC member, Oman, who cleverly and responsibly facilitated the recent talks between Iran and the US. Today, the US, the world, the region, and Iran are faced with common threat of extremist terrorist networks under the banner of Al-Qaeda. The continued financial and military support by some Syrian neighbors and some Persian Gulf states is resulting, is resulting in a strengthening thousands of Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists. However, the regional Arab countries need to understand that they are more vulnerable than Iran to the current extremist and terrorism spilling over from Syria. The sectarianism associated with the Syrian conflict would develop into different Sunni conflict, Sunni factions, and Shia Sunni wildfire across the whole region. War on terrorism and extremism should be priority agenda for the region and the world. GCC Iranian rapprochement would help ease sectarian tension, combat extremism and terrorism, fostering broader regional understanding that would, continue, uh, that would co uh, contribute to regional stability. The time has come for establishing a regional cooperation system among GCC, Iran, and Iraq. Iran's goal of gaining its rights, uh, rightful place at a re as a regional power can be achieved through cooperation and participation in a joint regional security cooperation system. Similarly, it would enable Iraq to take an important role in regional developments, achieve economic security and stability with revival of its status in the region. Such regional cooperation will transform the hostile rivalry between regional powerhouses, Saudi Arabia and Iran, into cooperation and shift the current Cold War status quo to a strategic engagement. The destruction of chemical weapons in Syria is the direct result of US-Russia-Iran joint cooperation. This type of united front, front and cooperation should be enhanced to realize the Middle East free from all weapons of mass destruction. Global powers, while advo advo advocating the, uh, for the zones uh, free from all weapons of mass destruction, have practically supported Israeli nuclear monopoly in the region. That's why in yesterday's plenary session, the US Secretary of State and the Canadian Foreign Minister were not able to respond to questions raised about Israeli nuclear arsenal. To be fair, the level of pressures exerted on Iran by the world powers, while Iran has no nuclear bomb and there is no evidence of diversion toward weaponization, should have been orchestrated against Israel with hundreds of nuclear bombs. In his yesterday's speech, Secretary Hegel said the US has exported over $70 billion of weaponry to GCC since 2007 and proposed annual meeting between the US and the GCC defense ministers. I believe first, the US should encourage periodic meeting among the defense ministers of GCC, Iran and Iraq to advocate regional self-reliance to maintain peace and stability in the Persian Gulf. Washington is 5,000 miles away from the Persian Gulf. The GCC countries, Iran and Iraq, are neighbors, 
and condemned to live together forever. They need to practice how to live in peace. Second, the U.S. should stop further militarization of the Persian Gulf. The arms race in the region and flood of sophisticated conventional arms provided by the global powers to their respective regional allies has accelerated the over-militarization of the region. To reduce expansion of weaponization in the region, there needs to be concerted effort made toward A, a treaty for Persian Gulf free of all weapons of mass destruction. Second, Middle East from free all weapons of mass destruction and third, Conventional Arms Arrangement Treaty in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for those remarks, for underlining in particular that the purpose of uh, Iran's negotiations uh, has been uh, detente with the region and with the West, and secondly, for adding uh, a new form in the GCC plus two arithmetic, uh, GCC plus uh, Iran and Iraq, and I'm sure there'll be comments from the floor about that uh, idea. Dr. Gary Seymour, floor is yours. Thank you very much, John, and congratulations for another successful dialogue. Uh, as John said, I don't uh, work for the White House anymore, so these are just my personal remarks. And I'd like to focus on the recent agreement between Iran and the P5 plus 1. I think this agreement is a useful first step, but it's a small step. All of the commentary, or much of the commentary, both pro and con, has been vastly exaggerated. This agreement is not a historic breakthrough that ushers in a new era of American-Iranian condominium and geopolitical realignment in the region. Nor is it a historic blunder that signals U.S. acceptance of Iran as a nuclear power. Instead, the interim deal is simply a six-month truce. Iran freezes or slows expansion of its nuclear program with some modest rollback and additional monitoring, and the P5 plus one agree not to impose new sanctions with some modest rollback of the existing sanctions. Neither side gives away its biggest bargaining chips, all actions are reversible, and the most difficult issues are kicked down the road for the final negotiations. In other words, this is exactly the kind of first step interim agreement you would expect in any negotiation in which the two sides are deeply divided, but both sides are looking for a way to avoid conflict. Now, I understand the uh, upset and resentment of U.S. allies in the region who are shocked at how quickly this interim agreement came together and whose feelings are damaged because the U.S. and Iran were carrying, carrying out secret negotiations in Oman without telling uh, its allies in the region. The truth is that President Obama has been looking for a diplomatic opening with Iran since 2009. Uh, when Iran rejected those overtures, President Obama created an international coalition that imposed unprecedented sanctions against Iran and finally forced Iran to come to the table. I think President Obama decided to use some of these bargaining chips to grab the opportunity for an interim agreement while it was available, rather than risk the chance that it would slip away because of domestic opposition in both Washington and in Tehran. Now, in moving so quickly, President Obama broke some crockery, both in Congress and in the region. But it was his crockery to break. And now Washington needs to show that it intends to strike a hard bargain in the negotiations for final status. When President Obama announced the interim deal, he said that in a final agreement, quote, Iran must accept strict limitations on its nuclear program that make it impossible for Iran to develop a nuclear weapon. And I understand the administration has already indicated through diplomatic channels that these measures will include dismantlement of a significant portion of Iran's uh, existing centrifuge inventory 
It will include closure of the Fordow enrichment plant. It will, it will include elimination of the Iraq heavy water research reactor, uh, resolution of weaponization issues, and additional inspection and monitoring by the IAEA. Uh, in effect, these measures would deny Iran the physical ability to produce significant quantities of weapons-grade uranium quickly before detection and disruption could take place, and it would strengthen verification to detect che cheating. Yet very few people believe that Iran would accept these restrictions under current conditions. As President Rouhani said, uh, Iran refuses to dismantle any of its existing nuclear facilities and insists on developing an industrial scale enrichment facility, tens of thousands of centrifuge machines, enough for a quick dash to a bomb, or more likely cover to build a secret enrichment facility. At the same time, President Obama cannot agree, cannot afford to agree to let Iran have a credible option to produce nuclear weapons, much less possess nuclear weapons, because it would pose unacceptable security threats to the U.S. and its Middle East allies in terms of the risk of war and further nuclear proliferation. And the truth is, any agreement that allowed Iran to become a nuclear threshold state is not politically viable in Washington even if the White House was prepared to accept it. And keep in mind that all of the sanctions legislation against Iran have passed by overwhelming veto-proof majority. So any deal the president strikes has to be defensible with Congress. Now that the situation is stabilized a bit with this interim agreement, neither side is under great pressure to quickly make big concessions in order to get a final deal. In fact, there may be incentives for both sides to, to stick to their maximal positions to show that they're not compromising too readily. So I predict that the six-month negotiations will not reach agreement on the central issue, whether or not Iran can become a nuclear threshold state under the guise of developing a civil nuclear energy program. At the same time, neither side wants the negotiations to collapse. That would mean going back to the same cycle of sanctions and nuclear activity, all leading to a risk of military confrontation, which both Washington and Tehran want to avoid. Therefore, I think the most likely outcome after six months of negotiations is another interim agreement, perhaps with some additional nuclear constraints and some additional sanctions relief. And this process of rolling interim agreements could last for some time, maybe years, maybe through the end of President Obama's term. In the meantime, the two sides will be arguing over implementation of the Joint Action Plan, which is full of ambiguities and silences, and they'll be waging an undercover contest over the sanctions regime. The White House claims that the sanctions relief under the interim agreement amounts to about $7 billion but that the most significant oil and financial sanctions will remain in place. And naturally, Iran will seek to undermine and circumvent those remaining sanctions in order to improve its economy and reduce pressure to make additional nuclear concessions, while the U.S. and its allies will be working hard to enforce the remaining sanctions so they have leverage to trade for additional nuclear concessions. Now, there's a debate among the sanctions experts about whether it's possible to selectively ease the sanctions, which have been built up over years, without destroying the entire apparatus as countries and companies maneuver in anticipation of resuming business with Iran. I, I frankly don't know the answer to that question, but the outcome will be critical to the nuclear negotiations. If Iran believes that the sanctions will fade away on their own, it has no incentive to make any additional concessions. If they can get it for free, why pay for it? But if the major sanctions remain intact and there's credible threat that additional sanctions could be imposed, then Iran is more likely to make additional nuclear concessions. Since no one really knows what will happen to the sanctions regime over the next six months, that's an additional reason for the two sides to wait and see before, it, before making any major concessions. So to conclude, the Joint Action Plan, uh, I think, is an opening bid in what is likely to be a very protracted and difficult negotiation with uncertain results. 
what will happen in the end? Pessimists say that the current interim agreement is likely to suffer the same fate as the previous interim agreement. You'll remember in 2003, when Iran was afraid that they were next on the American invasion list after Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, Iran agreed to suspend its enrichment program in exchange for agreement by the uh, big three European powers, UK, France, and Germany, to block US efforts to move the Iranian file to the Security Council. But after two years of frustrating negotiations and squabbling over implementation, um, uh, Tehran calculated that the, US, um, that the U.S. military machine was bogged down in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and Iran decided to walk away from the deal uh, and resume enrichment. Optimists say this time is different. In 2003, President Bush rejected Tehran's overtures, forcing Iran to turn to the Europeans. This time, President Obama has embraced the opportunity to negotiate directly with Iran, both to resolve the nuclear issue and to normalize relations. Um, in addition, some Iran experts think that President Rouhani plans to build on his diplomatic victory to pursue a broader policy of political and economic reform at home and a more moderate foreign policy abroad. In this scenario, Rouhani needs to neutralize the nuclear issue in order to keep his domestic opponents at bay, and therefore Iran might eventually accept a limited nuclear capacity under close supervision, but short of the ability to quickly produce large quantities of weapons-grade material. Of course, Supreme Leader Khamenei would have to be persuaded to go along with this strategy. Either way, I think it makes sense to pursue this opening. If it succeeds, it will be a remarkable diplomatic achievement that averts the excruciating choice between uh, Iran with a bomb and bombing Iran. If it fails, the US will be better able to justify to itself and to the world that it needs to take other actions. Thank you very much. Well, Gary, thank you very much for that very uh, precise and clean analysis and seeing that you were speaking from a text, we hope we can have it soon, put it up on our website so people can study it uh, with even greater uh, care. I think I'm now going to invite uh, uh, six or seven comments uh, uh, from the floor and then we'll come back uh, to the panel of three. I expect that much of the debate will be on, on Iran. Uh, Foreign Minister Salman Khurshid asked me to apologize on his behalf for the fact that he had an urgent um, meeting that was uh, recently and uh, scheduled to attend to, but the floor is open to you and the first uh, to have the floor is Professor Ali Ansari. Just speak, yeah. I'll just speak. Uh, thank you very much, John. My, my question is actually, uh, as you might have suspected for Dr. Musavian, it's partly a, a clarification, just to, uh, because one of the points that you announced I thought was uh, uh, remarkable in some ways in terms of the shaping of Iranian policy, and that was that you had said that in your view, uh, the United States would be crucial to any regional security framework in which Iran would be involved in. And I just wanted to sort of just check really with you that is, is that something that you see coming out of Iran that they're accepting basically a U.S. presence in the Persian Gulf and uh, a, some sort of security framework that in some ways seems to me to be going back to a pre-revolutionary mode of center or even the Baghdad Pact is what you seem to be talking about. Um, and what do the Russians think of that? I mean, that would be something that, I mean, have they made any comments? I just had one small one also, if I may, just President Rouhani in, the, um, in his second UN speech, which is rarely mentioned these days, uh, mentioned that he wanted Israel to join the NPT. That has been dropped, as far as I can see, from the discourse. The implicit, the implicit comment of that, of course, is that in some ways Iran would therefore uh, I know you're probably not going to like this, but uh, would have to tacitly recognize the state of Israel if they wanted them to join a, a, a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. But that hasn't been pursued, and I'm wondering why it hasn't been pursued. Thank you very much. Uh, and the next uh, is Francois Eisbourg. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, my question is also addressed to Hussein Moussavian, but also to uh, Gary Seymour. Now, now, yesterday, we heard Chuck Hagel talk about U.S. plans for increasing uh, US and GCC investment in ballistic missile defense systems in the region based on the continued Iranian 
ballistic missile threat. Now, I remember a conversation, uh, Hussein Musavian, that we had in early 2005 in Tehran, uh, in which the possibility of including Iran's ballistic missile program in a possible agreement between Iran and its EU3 negotiating partners of the time, this, this issue was broached. Now, of course, with George W. Bush being in power in Washington and with the subsequent election of Ahmadinejad a few months later in Iran, uh, nothing was going to come of this. But now we are negotiating in earnest. We've had a preliminary success with the interim agreement on the nuclear file. Shouldn't we now be considering opening a track for dealing with the ballistic missile issue? Because that is possibly a way of heading off an extremely costly and destabilizing arms race between ballistic missiles and ballistic missile defenses in the region. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, could I have uh, Dr. Uh, Syed Sajapur, please? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I have a question for uh, Dr. Turkey as well as Dr. Musavion, and that is based on what they said that the region, I mean, it's, they share this view that the region should be free of tension, regional cooperation is needed, and all these uh, very good ideas. My question is, how practical steps should be taken between GCC, Iran, and Iraq for establishing a regional cooperation? Uh, is it uh, a track two process should be started? Is it a UN initiative based on resolution 598 can be helpful? Is it an international conference? I mean, where should we start if we want? And we know that conditionality that you should do this, then I come that these are not going to be helpful. So practical steps. Now, a question for Dr. Gary Seymour is uh, the question that I asked uh, yesterday uh, from uh, Canadian uh, Foreign Minister and Dr. Musavian asked from Shark Hegel. Uh, and that is about Israel nuclear weapon. And I want you an answer because we didn't receive any answer. And I would like to mention, here is a context, you know, there is, there is a regional context. You ended by suggesting either have a bomb, bombing Iran or Iran has a bomb. I think this type of uh, militaristic uh, thinking is really detrimental for everybody. When we take it into account, the context of nuclearization of the Middle East by Israel, and no mentioning of it, even, in my, even when we ask a question. So are you confident enough to answer that? Furthermore, my question uh, for you, Dr. Gary Seymour, and I finish very quickly, is that this entry agreement is a time-bound agreement. And the goal and the end is clear, even the timing. So it's not going to be a long process of interim and interim, at least on the Iranian side. Uh, there is a political will and I think what you said, you made this deal just between U.S. and Iran, while we have five plus one, and the U.S. credibility is also at a stake. So I think I would somehow reject your prolongation process uh, of this uh, interim and interim. Uh, thank you very much. Mark Fitzpatrick. Uh, thank you. Gary, you did not call for new sanctions, but I thought I heard an implicit argument that unless there is a threat of new sanctions, there's not going to be any reason for uh, Iran to accept the kind of deep cuts that you outlined. Um, the argument that one often hears is that if there is such a uh, imposition of new sanctions, it uh, may well have the uh, countervailing uh, effect of uh, driving Iran away. and and then upping the ante uh, on its side uh, to try to create a countervailing uh, threat. Uh, the dynamics that you mentioned of U.S. domestic politics uh, could easily feed into that. I wonder how you see this uh, playing out. Thank you. And, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Wagida, yours in all now. 
Don't press anything, just no, speak. Yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to press anything, no. Uh, I have uh, two questions uh, uh, to Mr. Moussavian, first of all. Uh, is this a priority now uh, for you, for Iran, that is to say, to dismantle the GCC? I know you're proposing different structures, and uh, it seems that uh, this is uh, uh, probably step one would be the dismantling of the GCC. And secondly, would you kindly address all uh, the times that uh, you have heard people saying sh for Iran to show good faith and see if they would withdraw the fighters that uh, either belong to them directly or indirectly from Syria. Many Arabs are saying, well, show us the goodwill that uh, you're not also using Syria as your own battleground in your own way. And for His Royal Highness, uh, you heard, of course, the um, Omani foreign minister yesterday take the floor and uh, say, basically, uh, there is no there's absolute rejection of the Saudi initiative for a uh, union. And he's really actually blaming the Saudi uh, government for proposing a union. And he said to me personally, we published it in al Haya, that they are ready to withdraw from the GCC and to actually do something that would lead to the dismantling of the GCC should the Saudis insist. Why are you insisting on this and what do you think of what uh, the reaction of uh, now? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Asaban from Saudi Arabia. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, in my uh, earlier intervention in the session on energy, I indicated that this GCC region will continue to be very, very important to the rest of the world. And giving the latest revised uh, statistics and projections, we have seen that uh, the U.S. will not achieve energy independence until 2035. And the shale uh, gas production is basically unsustainable, and it is basically a bubble. So I think it is in the interest of not only the United States, but the rest of the world, as been indicated by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to get involved in order to achieve the security of the region. I and listen to my colleague from Iran saying that let us have a dialogue between Iran and GCC. But if it took 10 years to dialogue with the West, I, I'm, I'm not sure how long it will take this dialogue in order to achieve any meaningful uh, uh, results. So my question to both uh, Prince Turkey with regard to the role of Saudi Arabia in the energy market, which is very appreciable. And for you, uh, Mr. Mosefan, with regard to, you think the dialogue without the intervention of the West is going to be useful? And whether the, the suggestion by his uh, Royal Highness, uh, Prince Turkey, that we need GCC, we need to have a seat in the discussions and in the negotiation going on now for the, uh, to be concluded after six months. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sandy Verspov, Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, first of all, I, I'm very interested in the answer to Francois Aceborg's question about uh, Iranian readiness to uh, put its uh, ballistic missile programs on the table. But I, I would want to note that from a NATO perspective, uh, even uh, our missile defense plans are tied to many different sources of the threat, not just to Iran. Moreover, I think even in the best case in which not only the nuclear issue were resolved uh, along the lines Gary Samor outlined, but uh, there were cutbacks or elimination of the ballistic missile threat, there still would be a, a continuing rationale for ballistic missile defense, uh, at least as seen from the NATO perspective, since even in the best case, we would still see an Iranian breakout potential. Hopefully, if all the measures Gary proposed uh, as sort of the de, de minimis requirements uh, were, were fulfilled in an ultimate agreement, uh, we would still have a breakout period that would be just measured in a few years, I assume. Well, Gary may want to clarify that. Uh, and therefore, the, the need to, as a hedge, to maintain ballistic missile defense against the reconstitution of the threat would still exist. Uh, I'd like to ask a question directly to Mr. Musabian, who laid out a very beautiful vision of a regional detente. Uh, but I wonder uh, whether that vision is shared by all uh, key interest uh, groups within Iran. And in particular, is there any indication of a readiness on the part of uh, Iran's intelligence services, the uh, IRGC Quds Force, to, uh, 
to end their uh, destabilizing activities throughout the region. There's sponsorship of uh, extremist groups, of terrorist acts, some of which through proxies have even occurred on the territory of NATO member states, uh, Bulgaria in particular in, in, in recent period. Uh, certainly a, a regional detente without addressing those issues uh, would be uh, something of a mirage. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, um, could I have, uh, sorry, um, yeah, one more question from uh, Christopher Spiritu. Hi, thanks, John. In the past few years, we've witnessed uh, cyber attacks, Stuxnet against the Iranian facilities, Shamoon against uh, Saudi Aramco. So given the recent news reports, uh, what's more of a concern? This is my question for the, all the speakers. Reports of Pakistan providing nuclear weapons and nuclear technology to other countries, or Israel providing or co-developing cyber weapons with other countries? If we're willing to combat piracy and embrace the notion of a zone free of biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons, shouldn't we be working on including cyber weapons in our non-proliferation treaties and pacts with other countries? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I know that there are still some other questions. I've tried to get a balance of uh, different uh, perspectives. I think the, the, uh, the majority of questions were Mr. Musavian. Uh, Gary Seymour was coming up uh, also with, with a number, and I think there were two specific ones to Prince Torquay, and I think it best if we uh, conclude this plenary session with uh, those three speakers speaking in that order. So, Hassan Musavian, first, the question that were addressed to you, please. Were there uh, different frank fractions in Iran uh, uh, they have uh, consensus. First of all, let me say uh, I have no official position. I'm a scholar at Princeton University. If anyone wants the, the Rouhani's uh, uh, position, uh, Mr. Sajjadpour is the foreign ministry advisor here, and he can respond to the uh, audience about the official position of Iranian. What I'm saying is my own experience being 30 years with the, the administration. Uh, the initiative of regional cooperation system between Iran and the neighbors is not new. Uh, you ask about this, uh, whether Iran is going to dismantle GCC or not. We proposed this in 1990. Uh, Dr. Velayati was foreign minister. He visited in 1991-92 all GCC countries and propose to establish a regional cooperation system between Iran and the neighbors. Therefore, this is not something new that you think uh, Iran is after in now dismantling of GCC and so and so. This has been consensus since 20 years in Iran, even within security establishments, that ultimately only a regional cooperation system would resolve peace, security, stability, and friendship with the neighbors. This is uh, a, a real consensus. Uh, about uh, GCC having a seat uh, at P5 plus one, uh, uh, I remember it was in uh, spring 2005 when Dr. Rouhani was Secretary of uh, National Security Council. I was his deputy. We visited all GCC countries and we raised our readiness for uh, co regional cooperation on the nuclear issue uh, and to share the technology, the, 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 the capability with the region to have it a regional uh, as, uh, asset. But none of the GCC heads we met welcomed the initiative. Uh, whether they, if, if they, they, they want to have a seat, I think Iran would prefer to sit with GCC and to resolve the nuclear issue rather than to sit uh, with the P5 plus one. Uh, but uh, I don't believe uh, the P5 would accept because Israelis are asking a seat, other countries are asking a seat, uh, and uh, I don't know whether this would be possible or not. Uh, sanctions um, and uh, two scenarios, my friend Gary said, I think, uh, about Iranian nuclear program. First of all, whether sanctions have brought Iran to the table or not, it is a big mistake. I heard from uh, many speakers yesterday that pressure, sanctions put Iran to the negotiation. 
Gary has uh, published a book, 2005, WIWS. He has Iranian proposal, March 2005. If you compare the Iranian proposal in March 2005, before sanctions, you would see this is exactly the proposal, the agreement Iran signed in 2003 after sanctions. Iranian position has no changed. Because from the beginning, Iran was ready for every transparency measures, every confidence building measures on no breakout, insisting on the rights. If you see the proposal 2005 is exactly with the same proposal of 2003, then you should ask what changed really to make the deal possible. It was the US position. It was not Iranian position. The US position was no enrichment in Iran in 2003 to 2005, Gary, right? And 2013, the US said no nuclear bomb. This is a big difference between no nuclear bomb and no enrichment. That's why we could, we could make the deal. Next six months, if this is the red line, Iran would be cooperative because Iranians have no problem for transparency measures. Iranians are not after nuclear bomb. If they want to make nuclear bombs, they would make it. No one can prevent them. But they don't want, this is the reality. Even during the war, when Saddam used chemical weapons, Iranians did not reciprocate with chemical weapons. Uh, about uh, my friend's question, Ali, uh, I think you misunderstood me, Ali. I believe the US should support a regional cooperation system. No one can deny the role of the US in the region. This is one issue. Whether the US should present, have a presence here forever, military presence, no. First, we need to establish with the US, with the West, with the international power support, this regional cooperation system. Of course, we would need to consider the US concerns, the NATO concerns, the, the, the Chinese, the, the, the Indians, the, the Russians, every concern, the world powers they have. After establishing this regional cooperation system, rather than the US military, I believe uh, the, uh, a joint military task force by GCC, Iran, and Iraq should keep the stability of the Persian Gulf, not the US warships. Uh, Israelis, Iran has been insisting for decades that the Israelis, they have to give up their nuclear weapons and they have to sign to uh, NPT. There is no change. It is not uh, any... Francois, about your question on, uh, on uh, missile. Iran would not make a deal, as far as I understand, on missile issue with the P-5. But Iran would be ready to make the deal with the regional countries. Because you have to consider the, 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 the balance, the reality in the region. Chuck Hagel said $70 billion of sophisticated arms to GCC from, since 2007. It is over $200 billion of, dollars of sophisticated arms to GCC since revolution. Iranians, have, they have to have their own capabilities. There is a big difference between Iran and GCC. GCC is importing the arms, Iran is building the arms. Iran has capability to build uh, submarines, uh, tanks, missiles, jet, jet fighters, everything. Therefore, this is, this is a, a, a balance which should be discussed in the region. If there is a regional cooperation system, if there is a regional arrangement for uh, no weapons of mass destruction, even in the Persian Gulf, and uh, the arrangement on uh, conventional arms between the regional countries, then Iran would be flexible on, on, on uh, the missile. Otherwise, if you are going to uh, disable Iranian uh, missile facility, capability and export another hundred billions of dollars of uh, sophisticated arms to the region, Iranians, they would not accept. Oh, uh, about question, uh, Kazem uh, asked, 
what practical steps do we need the second track? I don't believe we need the sec second track. We are brothers in the region. Second track is with the US, which is very difficult, 34 years hostilities between Iran and the US. But with our Arab friends, we don't need second track. Uh, uh, in in mid-1990s, I went, I sat with uh, Crown Prince Amir Abdullah four rounds, four nights, and we agreed uh, uh, on comprehensive package between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Everybody remembers 1996, 1997 to 2005, Iran-Saudi Arabia relation was perfect. It was very good at least. And then Dr. Rouhani signed the security pact. This, I think, should come first in bilateral relations. Iran and each GCC countries, they need to sit together on, on, on security concerns, security pact, bilateral relations, and then try to build up the regional cooperation system. Gary Seymour. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, let me just clarify one thing my friend Hassan said. This new uh, interim agreement uh, requires that there be mutual agreement on, um, on the size of Iran's enrichment program numbers and types of centrifuges and so forth. That will be the key issue in the negotiations. Uh, President Rouhani, when I met him in New York, said that Iran needs to have an enrichment facility large enough to fuel a nuclear power reactor. That means tens of thousands of centrifuge machines, much more than Iran currently has. The US, in contrast, will be seeking Iranian agreement to a very small sized enrichment program so that it can't quickly produce large amounts of weapons grade material. Uh, I hope that issue can be resolved, but even though the US had changed its position from zero enrichment, it's still a long way from, from what Iran's position is. Now to go to the questions, um, first of all, Francois, I think as you heard from Hassan, I think it's very difficult to separate the ballistic missile issue from broader questions of the conventional balance of power in the Persian Gulf. And the fundamental tension there, which is perfectly understandable, is that Iran, as the biggest power, doesn't want any external power to intrude, whereas the other countries in the Gulf uh, want the presence of a larger external power in order to balance Iran. And I don't think that fundamental conflict can be easily resolved, and that's why it's hard to resolve the ballistic missile issue. Mark asked about sanctions. I don't think Congress will pass new sanctions during the six-month period and blow up this agreement. Um, but I do think after six months, if there's no progress, there will be increasing pressure, both in Washington and in Tehran, as we heard from Qasem. People will say, this is just an endless process. It's not going anywhere. And for that reason, I think there'll be pressure on both sides to show some incremental agreement or some incremental progress, even if they can't solve the whole thing, there are smaller pieces they might pick out and make progress on. Now, finally, let me try to answer a chasm on the Israel issue, because I think this is something I'm asked whenever I travel around the Middle East, including most recently, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Turkey was kind enough to host me in, in Saudi, and I had a chance to discuss this. And the you know, best way I can explain it is this. In government, you have to make choices about what you can do. You have limited resources, limited time. You face a whole range of difficult issues. Now, more than 50 years ago, the US, under President Kennedy and then under President Johnson, tried to persuade Israel not to develop nuclear weapons once, the, once that program became peaceful in 1960. We failed. If you're looking at the world now, what can you do and what can't you do, it is still achievable under current circumstances to try to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons. The U.S. is focused on that. The Israelis have said they'll join the NPT, they'll accept a nuclear weapons or Middle East free zone in the region when the political conditions that threaten their security have changed. Uh, Secretary Kerry is working very hard to try to bring about a change in political circumstances so we can achieve a WMD free zone in the Middle East. But to expect that we can convince Israel in the absence of that change in political conditions is just not practical. It's not within the power of the United States. Royal Highness Prince Torquay. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I'll take the subjects one by one, not necessarily referring to the people who, who made them. First of all, to my friend Musavian, and just to make the balance sheet that he made, talked about of failures in the Middle East, on whether by Saudi Arabia or by other participants, more equally balanced. I would add another failure to the Iranian efforts. Uh, so it'll be two and two, because he admitted to one failure. Um, and, and that is the failure to export the revolution. Uh, it hasn't happened. Um, on the, also, I'm very grateful to Mr. Musavian for giving a GCC country the credit for what is happening, which is Oman and the talks that they had. Excellent. Uh, thank you for giving us the credit for that. Um, and I would disagree with him on calling us living together being condemned to live together. <laughs> um, I would prefer to use to, uh, the word blessed uh, to be together. And this is how the Saudi Arabia looks upon our good neighbors. Um, and on the practical steps one of the gentlemen asked for, I agree with Mr. Musawiyan. We don't need track two, track three, or track four. We are here. The Iranians are here. This is what we want. This is what you want. Let's sit down together and resolve the issue. So it is not a matter of, of inventing the wheel again. It is a very practical steps, as I mentioned in my presentation, and as Mr. Musavian mentioned in his. On uh, Raghda Dargham's question on Omani rejection of GCC union, Oman have every right to express that, that view, and they have expressed it within and without uh, the circles of the GCC. I don't think that is going to prevent the union from happening. And the other countries, and most importantly, I think the people in the GCC truly want the union and feel a necessity for it. And as the situations develop, as we see all around us, um, having a union, a more closely knit uh, uh, union between the GCC countries, in my view, is inevitable. Uh, and whether a man wants to join now or later or at a Another time, that's up to them to, uh, to sort out. On cyber weapons, I agree with the gentleman who mentioned, Yani, whatever uh, zone free of weapons of mass destruction will have to include not just cyber weapons, but also delivery systems, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that is, I think, something that can be very uh, much included in such a zone. I forgot to mention in my presentation uh, one aspect of the proposal that I made on the zone, which is in addition to the guarantees that the five permanent members would give on providing nuclear security umbrella and uh, uh, a military sanction on the other side, um, I, I would say that the five permanent members would come out with a statement saying, we want the zone to happen in the Middle East. You in the Middle East, have five years to establish a zone. Go solve the Arab-Israeli problem. Do whatever it is to increase cooperation between both sides of the Gulf, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're, th we're there, and this is what we want, and these are what we're going to propose. And uh, the other thing I was glad, truly, and this is a genuine um, uh, uh, statement, is that I see spokesmen from Iran, and not just here, but I think in other, in other uh, uh, fora and, and, and uh, discussions, have dropped the, 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 if you like, the Cold War rhetoric that they had before. Yani. We no longer hear about the big Satan. We don't even hear about the little Satan. Um, it's, uh, the US is in, invited to become a, uh, a member of the, of the GCC, Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Entente. Um, th that's wonderful news because this is the reality of life. Whether we like it or not, whether it is the American fleet, the Russian fleet, or the British fleet, or the French fleet, or the Indian fleet, or whatever you like, they're going to come into the Gulf for their own interests and be there. So accepting that reality and working with all of these uh, uh, countries to make sure that there is genuine security and uh, safety 
for all of us in, uh, in the Gulf area is, is, is a welcome development to see uh, on, the, on the new thinking that is taking place in, in Iran. And one last thing I would say, in the past, what we saw of Iranian actions, there, there is an, an Arabic expression there, to describe them in the past. And that was, Asma' kalamak ya jibni, ashuf amaylak at hajjib. Which is, I, 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 hear, I hear what you say, which I like. I see your actions, and I don't like them. Uh, nowadays, I think going forward with whatever Mr. Musavian has proposed in cooperation and so on, we're still hearing words. We'd like to see those words translated into action. Your Royal Highness, uh, Said Musavian, Dr. Gary Seymour, Thank you very much for uh, your presentations and uh, uh, for the active engagement uh, in this final uh, concluding plenary of the Manama Dialogue. I think uh, uh, we have had an extraordinary expression of strategic thought uh, in this final plenary, just as we had uh, in the earlier ones. And I hope uh, uh, that people will take away from this uh, ideas uh, of practical uh, cooperation. We started this. Uh, Manama Dialogue 45 hours ago, and we will conclude it only 15 minutes late. So I think we have shown a degree of discipline that is uh, impressive. Uh, the Manama Dialogue uh, is intended to provide a platform for the launching of policy initiatives and a framework for intergovernment uh, consultations. We have had an enormous group of people represented here, over 30 countries, 480 delegates, some 1,000 delegate bads uh, issued, and we have had a number of policy uh, initiatives launched at this Manama Dialogue. There has been uh, discussion of GCC engagement with the P5 plus one uh, process. There's been the proposal from the United States for a GCC US Defense Ministerial Conference. We have just heard the reiteration of a long standing proposal for a GCC plus Iraq plus Iran regional security cooperation fora. We've counted at least eight or nine other novel uh, policy innovations that have been suggested by ministers uh, at uh, this Manama Dialogue. And our concluding report that will be issued in a couple of weeks' time uh, will summarize those that were given uh, in uh, the public domain. There have also been very serious intergovernmental uh, consultations. Uh, the ISS has uh, facilitated a number of them. By Saturday afternoon, some 82 bilateral meetings between participating governments had been scheduled. By this afternoon, just over 100 will have been uh, conducted. And the debate has shown uh, that we can engage uh, simultaneously in intellectual uh, provocation uh, and reasoned uh, debate. There have been differences in point of view uh, expressed uh, by different ministers, frankly, in a way that leaves no doubt about uh, the positions held by different uh, countries. And we're delighted that the Manama Dialogue provides a safe and comfortable context to air these different points of view. But overall, I think delegates here have sought to harness uh, common sense to strategic uh, purpose. The International Institute for Strategic Studies will work to make the 2014 Manama Dialogue, the 10th Manama Dialogue, a very special occasion with your uh, support. And we'll be encouraging full ministerial-led delegations from the Middle East, Europe, North America, and Asia to make a special effort uh, next year to engage uh, senior leaders from all parts of the world uh, in uh, the Manama uh, Dialogue. And as I said at the outset on Friday, this is a process, not just an event, and the International Institute for Strategic Studies will be engaging with all the governments represented here, and some that were not able this year to be represented, to make certain that we share our analysis uh, on international security trends that are thought to be of use to you, but also learn from all of you the subjects that should be uh, the subject of more considered public debate and government policy uh, considerations. May I take this opportunity uh, to thank His Majesty uh, the King, uh, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince, 
Uh, the Foreign Minister of the Kingdom of Bahrain, Sheikh Khalid bin Ahmed, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the BDF, and the many other uh, figures and agencies of the government who have supported this uh, important endeavor. Uh, in support also have been here 20 IISS staff drawn from our offices in London, uh, Washington, and Bahrain that have made this the smoothest run and I think most efficiently conducted dialogue in this excellent series. It has been one team bound by their keenness to ensure that this multilateral forum serves the interests of deepening understanding and strengthening uh, international cooperation. We all look forward to gathering again uh, in uh, December 2014. I want to thank all of you for your participation and wish you a safe journey home. Thank you very much.